tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A Burnaby-based anti-drone company sues a former worker over fears he may have shared confidential information that could threaten national security. Plus... That would be very stressful for me personally, just because I don't do good at mornings. Some Burnaby High School students may have their schedules upended because of overcrowding. This is a problem with how schools are built at the provincial level. And... I really couldn't have afforded it not to drop. The Bank of Canada's interest rate cut is welcome news for some mortgage holders and would-be buyers. It's giving people a little bit more sort of encouragement to, to actually step up and make offers. This is CBC Vancouver News. Hello, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. A Burnaby-based anti-drone company is now suing a former employee over fears he may have shared confidential information that could threaten national security. As Jason Proctor reports, a BC judge issued an order to use, used to seize the man's electronic devices last month. This legal battle all happened behind closed doors until this week, and it basically pulls the curtain back on the incredibly competitive world of anti-drone technology. There is a company based in Burnaby called Skycope, which is a world leader in this technology that allows people to identify the frequencies and protocols that allow drones to fly. And so what Skycope have done is build what they call a drone library containing the frequencies of about 450 different types of drones that allow them to identify them and essentially knock them out of the sky. And so what happens in August, an engineer with the company says he's resigning. That sparks alarm bells for the CEO who says he wants to sit down and discuss why is he leaving. The guy tells him it's for money and he's not going to another anti-drone company, which, according to these court documents, the CEO finds suspicious. So he goes through the guy's workspace at some point and finds his personal email up and allegedly finds that he's been in contact with a foreign competitor based out of Abu Dhabi. And so that's how this ends up in the courts because Skycope claims that this man has been sharing confidential information, including information about drones given by the Canada's Defense Department to this competitor. And there are fears for national security because an expert on national security says China's and Russia's militaries may be interested in this information. Based on that, an order is given to seize the man's electronic devices. It happens in a forum where the man is not there. And so the first thing he knows about this lawsuit and the order is when nine people, including bailiffs, lawyers, and people from the company, show up on his doorstep and seize all of his phones. I spoke to his lawyer. He says he's committed no wrongdoing and had no intention of committing any wrongdoing. A lawyer for Skycope told me the military and the police have not been informed of this uh, because the whole thing was sealed up until now. But of course, it's now in the public domain, so they can act as they want. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Vancouver. The Burnaby School District, meanwhile, is warning some high schools could move to staggered class scheduling next school year. That is because increased enrollment is creating a serious space crunch. More now from Karen Larson. A Cole Alpha Secondary in North Burnaby is one of five high schools in the city that could be moving to a staggered schedule because of overcrowding. A staggered schedule means students won't all attend at the same time, with the school day starting earlier and ending later in order to add an additional block of classes. For some, that could mean starting as early as 8 in the morning. That would be very stressful for me personally, just because I don't do good at mornings. Like, I don't even have a first period. I've just been hearing a lot of grade 8s complain about this, because most of them stay up till 1, 2. And, like, teenagers out of every age group need the most sleep statistically. Um, so it's actually better for school to start at, like, 9 for teenagers than actually earlier. With the explosion of residential high-rises at nearby Brentwood, Alpha is bursting at the seams. The school was upgraded in 2019, but not built nearly big enough. It's the same thing down the road at Burnaby North Secondary, home of the Vikings, and possibly the new staggered schedule. Burnaby North was over capacity the first day it opened in January after extensive upgrades. 
We've been seeing the problem growing. The chair of the Burnaby District Parent Advisory Council says staggered schedules create all sorts of potential issues. Concerns around um, how is it going to affect extracurricular activities, how is it going to affect families when you've got multiple children and one starting at one time, one starting at another. Every Burnaby family with a high school student got this letter today. This Burnaby PAC member took to social media to highlight the proposal. He says schools will only become even more overcrowded without a change in planning. This isn't really a school district problem or even a school board problem. This is a problem with how schools are built at the provincial level. Burnaby School Superintendent Karim Hashleff was not available for an interview. In a statement, he says, the pace of growth at many of our high schools is such that we can't wait to build ourselves out of the capacity issues. Karen Larson, CBC News, Burnaby. The Kamloops Thompson School District, meanwhile, is looking at job cuts as it tries to recover from a more than $2 million deficit because of an accounting error. Superintendent Rhonda Nixon says the error happened when a piece of revenue was counted twice. A budget reduction plan outlined in September saw reduced supplies and increased fees for field trips. But Nixon says that was not enough and job cuts are necessary. She didn't give a speci specific number of staff laid off and says the cuts are not affecting the classrooms directly. The Kamloops Thompson Teachers Association says they are pleased with the outcome. To BC Politics now, Green Party leader Sonia Furstenau is staying tight-lipped after Saturday's razor-thin election, revealing little about her party's plans to possibly prop up a minority government. She does say she spoke with NDP leader David Eby. Could you give a sense of what the conversation with David Eby was like this morning? Uh, it was a conversation. Oh, come on. <laughs> First and now lost in a new running, but plans to stay on as party leader for now. While she declined to say how much more, much more until the final vote tallies are in, she says she did not answer the phone when Conservative leader John Rustad called, saying she didn't recognize the number. She admits she has concerns about his party. There have been statements made by Conservative candidates that are truly disturbing. Racist, dehumanizing, homophobic, and conspiratorial. Some of these candidates have been elected. And I have yet to see a satisfactory response from John Rustad around this. The NDP are leading or elected in 46 seats, the Conservatives at 45 and the Greens in two. In 2017, the Greens under then leader Andrew Weaver formed a confidence and supply agreement with the NDP that made John Horgan Premier. In 2020, though, Horgan called a snap election, claiming the Greens had broken a rule of their deal by introducing a government bill without notification. Horgan then won a commanding majority. The province's police watchdog has been called in after Mountie shot and killed a man in Penticton on Tuesday. The RCMP says a man was acting erratically and reportedly holding a knife on Government Street just after 3 in the afternoon. The Independent Investigations Office says an officer was hurt while trying to arrest him and shot the man. He was taken to hospital and later died. The officer was treated for non-life-threatening injuries. The IIO is asking anyone with video footage or other information to contact them. Two years ago, after he was elected, Vancouver Mayor Ken Sim committed to hiring 100 more mental health nurses for the city. But putting that promise into action has not been that straightforward. As Chad Pawson explains, as of now, 35 extra mental health workers have been hired, and he has more on why those numbers have changed. The good news is there are more mental health workers on Vancouver's streets to more adequately respond to people in crisis and help reduce social disorder. It's just not the 100 mental health nurses that the government here at City Hall promised two years ago. And I think context is important. So uh, the idea was bringing in 100 uh, mental health nurses to help and we left it to the experts. The experts came back and they said a better plan would be 58 individuals in a whole bunch of different categories. The political promise of 100 nurses has changed, first whittled down to 58 positions and now actually 55, and only 35 of those positions filled at this point. The aim with these hires is for a more targeted and more diverse approach, despite the numbers being lower than promised. Sure, police response teams paired with nurses have been expanded, but there's also a mobile crisis de-escalation team that now has 14 workers, with a further 18 to be hired, and there's a unique 
Creek Indigenous Crisis Response Team. It has nine staff with health and cultural workers able to provide a holistic and non-police response. Architects from Vancouver Coastal Health say the more nuanced way is making a difference, that healthcare workers across disciplines on Vancouver streets were important and needed compared to a critical mass of nurses. Outreach workers in Vancouver's downtown east side say they aren't surprised that the 100 mental health nurses did not happen. They say it was never feasible, but hope the current path connects people with the services they desperately need. Mayor Ken Sim says although it's not his election promise, it's a collaborative approach uniquely tailored for the city's needs, something his council is willing to put up to $8 million a year behind. I think uh, this has uh, gone incredibly well. Uh, the health authority has the resources and the commitment from the city that we've never wavered on and they are like making a huge impact. So what next? Well, the mobile de-escalation team needs to keep hiring to fill gaps such as being able to respond on weekends. Also expected in the new year, a more fulsome evaluation of the entire program, which will include feedback from clients and how they felt about how it helped them. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Vancouver. Darius Mandavi is here with a look at the weather, and there'll be some snow falling in B.C. Yes, there is. Uh, we had some snow earlier in the central interior. Uh, that is uh, expected to taper off as we head later into the night and into tomorrow. If you take a look at the south coast, things are nothing but calm here. Uh, we're not expecting to see any significant precipitation until Friday overnight into Saturday, which you can take a look at here. Some more showers, maybe some flurries at higher elevations will continue to pump up on parts of the south coast uh, tonight and into tomorrow. Uh, but here in Vancouver, don't expect to be wet. Maybe a shower possible in uh, the Fraser Valley, but you can see Friday is when we really start to see that precipitation come in. We'll be heavy at times and in some places, but it doesn't seem like the precipitation amounts will be too high. The big thing here uh, for Metro Vancouver, at least, and for Victoria, is probably going to be those winds. It's looking quite gusty as we get into overnight Friday into Saturday and maybe into Saturday morning. But again, for tonight, Dan, mostly calm conditions, maybe a little bit more snow in the caribou. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. The city of Vancouver says it will shut down its only sanctioned homeless encampment by early next month. The designated area has been in place since 2022. And as Liam Britton explains, one of the few remaining campers there says he has few options to come indoors safely. To come to a closure. Vancouver Park Board Manager Steve Jackson says after three plus years, the Crab Park Camp is a safety hazard for people living there and a barrier to the broader community's enjoyment of the waterfront park. As this is an important park to this neighborhood, there are over 6,000 residents within a 10 minute walk of Crab Park. Uh, and with the park board's mandate of providing safe access to green space, it's important that this space be returned to the community. In just two weeks, the city hopes to have closed the encampment. It says seven people still live there. They've been offered housing, but have mostly refused. Offers with one person having refused three offers. Just last week, a very, very good housing offer was refused, uh, and uh, we were quite disappointed. Sasha Cristiano is one of those few remaining residents. He claims he's never been offered housing, and even so, he doesn't want to live in an SRO. It's, it's, it's a sour environment for anybody. Um, anybody who wants to get get clean. A lot of my friends, they relapsed and then a couple of them died. The officials claim some advocates are influencing people not to accept housing offers. They're urging those advocates to help get the campers indoors. Uh, our hope is that that doesn't continue and that, um, and, that they, uh, and that they work to support people to come inside. Absolutely. Yeah. Fiona York, a longtime Crab Park advocate, called that accusation false adding it detracts from a deeper issue of adequate housing for marginalized communities. Now, this won't be the city's first attempt to end the long-running homeless camp, which is just the latest example of such camps in a city and a province facing an ongoing homeless crisis. It first arose with about 100 people in the spring of 2021. Months later, the city issued eviction orders, but a Supreme Court judge said no, finding the city was unreasonable to assume campers could find suitable indoor housing if kicked out of the park. Since 2022, the encampment has been confined to a smaller, designated area of the park. Jackson and Singh say even once this next eviction order takes effect, ideally by November 7th, nighttime tenting will still be allowed, a right established by the courts. York called the eviction announcement, quote, deplorable and reprehensible, but not surprising. Liam Britton, CBC News, Vancouver.
The biggest rate drop since the pandemic, what it means for big purchases, and might there be more cuts to come? That's next. Vancouver firefighters are getting new PFAS-free gear. PFSAs are a toxic group of chemicals known to cause many health complications, including cancer. Crews say the previous gear was not PFS-free. Our firefighters are at risk every single day from the job that they do, from going into the fires, from the smoke, uh, from the toxins, from the shift work. And uh, the gear that they're wearing also contributes to that. Fry says in the last seven years, 34 firefighters have died because of occupational cancer. The city has spent almost $3 million on the new gear. The Bank of Canada is dropping its trend-setting interest rate again, this time cutting it by half a percentage point rather than the usual quarter. It's welcome news for anyone with a variable rate mortgage. But as Anise Haidari reports, experts are on alert for other economic issues. The Bank of Canada is picking up the pace, making a big cut to its key rate. We took a bigger step today because inflation is now back to the 2% target and we want to keep it close to the target. 
The central bank's interest rate down by half a percentage point to 3.75 percent, attempting to ensure the economy doesn't cool off too much. We need demand to strengthen, take up the slack. For one thing, lower interest rates can make mortgages cheaper, freeing up money to spend elsewhere. I've seen a drop of around $200, $300 um, monthly, which, is, which adds up to my budget, and I'm able to allocate money wherein I would uh, previously think twice. But high rates affect more than just mortgages. So I believe um, if interest rates don't go back to sustainable levels, we're going to struggle in the long run. Well, we're not even in neutral. Some economists say the Bank of Canada needed to move faster. And clearly, the softening in labor market is probably a big surprise to them, the speed at which it has softened, but also the speed at which inflation has come down. And saying they should have cut more before the U.S. election, because Americans can drastically affect Canada's economy, too. What happens in the U.S. will be a primary driver on whether or not we slow down more than what's expected in the Bank of Canada's forecast uh, in 2025. With economic growth already slow, the central bank will be watching how Canadians and Canadian businesses start spending before making their next decision in early December. Anis Hedari, CBC News, Calgary. Well, as we said, that rate cut is welcome news to some mortgage holders and would-be buyers here in B.C. As Michelle Gassoub explains, the real estate industry is also hoping it will bump up sales that have slumped for months. A 50 basis point slash from the Bank of Canada making borrowing a little less scary this fall and rates a little friendlier for mortgage holders. Yeah, it's welcome. I renew in July, so I was happy to see that because I really couldn't have afforded it not to drop. From 4.25 to 3.75 percent, this cut is the biggest in four years. And in B.C., Canada's most expensive province, every penny counts. People who are in that situation will see a relief of $30 per month per 100000 that they owe. So, you know, let's say there's a family with a $500,000 mortgage, they're going to feel $150 a month less per payment. That drop also means more would-be buyers could become become first-time owners. This interest rate decrease does offer somewhere between $45,000 and $50,000 of extra buying power for people looking to enter the market. That's not a little, that's not a little number. You know, that will help somebody uh, on the sidelines get into their first apartment or condo or townhouse. Over the past years, sales have slumped. But will this series of cuts turn that around or even ignite a red-hot market? Yeah, you know, I don't like to, to, to fear monger people and say, oh my God, you got to run out and buy today because next year the prices are going to be 10, 15 percent higher. I mean, I think that what we're seeing is just a, a moderation uh, of sales activity. It's giving people a little bit more sort of encouragement to, to actually step up and make offers. The Bank of Canada is expected to make more cuts and in expensive B.C., some say the rate needs to come down even more. Probably it's a point away from a more realistic uh, uh, financial situation, you know, on the positive side. Still, welcome news as rates continue to fall. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. A look at the day that was in White Rock, a sunny, gorgeous fall day. Plenty of people enjoying the seaside and Canada's longest pier, don't you know? Darius Madavi will be back with his BC wide weather forecast after the break.
The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, call Direct Buy Furnace. Installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. Darius Madavi is here with our BC wide weather forecast as we wait for some more rain. More rain, but not the same rain. I want to emphasize that. Thankfully. Uh, yes, uh, you're mm. probably familiar with this map, but it's looking a little bit different as we head into this weekend. Not that continuous stream of moisture, but just one bit breaking off. Now, with that being said, the rain will be coming in and out throughout the weekend. It won't be consistent rainfall right through over the three days, uh, but we will have quite a few wet days in a row, starting probably Friday night and then continuing through Saturday, uh, coming in and out on Sunday, showery, and then same showery on Monday. Uh, but you can see that here across the south coast for as we get into Friday, that wave of precipitation comes in very late in the day, probably hitting the west coast of uh, Vancouver Island by late evening and then continuing to make its way at around midnight, probably hitting uh, Vancouver. And then that first big wave is probably going to be the heaviest as we get into the morning on Saturday, maybe continuing into Saturday afternoon or evening. But after that, uh, it's really just showers coming in and out, maybe in the overnight periods, uh, Saturday into Sunday, Sunday into Monday, we'll see some more consistent rainfall, but generally during the day, getting a little bit more calm for uh, Sunday and Monday. You can see that here as well. We have some precipitation feeding into parts of the province, uh, snow coming into the central interior at times, most of that precipitation though affecting the coast. Uh, freezing levels are actually going to come up. Uh, tomorrow night is definitely our coolest night and then freezing levels start to rise, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, our highs though staying fairly consistent. We will see some fluctuations in the interior of about five degrees or so over the entire three or four day period over the next three or four days. Uh, but uh, here on the coast, not seeing too much fluctuation coming uh, down to our, pro our lowest high will probably be 10 or 11, and then our highest probably around 13 degrees. Uh, if we take a look at the lows though, those are dropping quite a bit tomorrow. Vancouver down to just three degrees, Whistler into the negatives. Uh, then as we get into uh, fr uh, Friday night, sorry, we're gonna see those lows start to come back up a little bit along with those freezing levels again. So less snow as we head into the weekend because things are warming up a little bit. Uh, we have some uh, sunshine across much of the province tomorrow, just that rain affecting the coast, possibly some snow overnight tonight in Whistler, then transitioning into showers as we get into the morning and things start to warm up. And lastly, in terms of a five day forecast, Dan, a couple days of mixed skies, then that rain starts and is fairly persistent through the weekend. Okay, thanks Darius. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on CBC Vancouver News. For any time news, check our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That starts tomorrow morning at 5.30. Good night.